Our speaker, uh, Linda K. Wertheimer, is a former education editor for the Boston Globe. She was a full-time reporter and editor for more than 20 years at several newspapers, including the Boston Globe, the Dallas Morning News, and the Orlando Sentinel. She is not, as she often likes to say, the other Linda of NPR's All Things Considered. Our Linda's book, Faith Ed, Teaching About Religion in an Age of Intolerance, here's her well-worn copy, um, chronicles public schools' efforts to teach about the world religions in several regions of our country. Her book has been reviewed in the New York Times, and featured in many radio and TV programs since its publication in August. Excerpts and articles from her book research have already won several awards. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in journalism from Northwestern University, and she teaches here in Boston, both at Boston University as a part-time faculty member and at Grub Street, a writer's organization in town. And you can learn more about her work at Linda K. She will speak, I think, she will speak, I think, for about 30 minutes or so, to whatever, there's no real constraint. And then we'll have another 30 or 40 minutes of conversation amongst ourselves. And at the end, we will uh, adjourn outside, and books will be sold, or co copies of her book will be sold, and I'm sure she'll be happy to, to sign them for you as well. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming the book.
to a public school? Did you have any religious symbols in your school? No. So this is sort of, in my thought, this is a little bit of the wave of the future where this teacher has all of these different religious symbols on the windowsill. And when you read my book, hint, hint, not kidding, um, you will see towards the end that there's a student who was scared to death when she saw that windowsill. She was a Pentecostal Christian, and a Palestine, I'm going to say this wrong, so someone correct me from the, from the theology department, apostolic, and her belief was no idols, so she thought she was going to burn in, can I say hell in Okay. She thought she was going to burn in hell <laughs> because of seeing this. So that, that window plays a little bit of a role in the last chapter. I also think it's a beautiful image as well, and she grew to, well, I don't want to give it away. Okay. So Sherry's view is kids are more mature and they're more able to handle the material in ninth grade than they would be in sixth grade, and she had taught middle school. And then there's the superintendent, let's see, uh, here we go. Did everybody read that from way back there? Okay. So he firmly believes that education cannot be, nor should it be, a panacea for teasing and bullying that may occur in younger grades. And so he actually was a little more blunt than that, as you can see. You know, we can't make them into little saints and tolerant people, was exactly how he said it to me. And he, he also said they're not going to remember if they, we teach them earlier. So we've heard that now repeatedly. And they said that if, if we teach them in ninth grade, it prepares them for world history, but it does something else. They felt even in ninth grade, it taught these kids how to stand up for the religious minorities. And there is a researcher, you can look him up, Emil Lester, and he actually did serve, I could see some nods, he did surveys of the students in Modesto before they took the course, I think in the middle of the course, after the course, and his research showed that more often than not, they were willing to stand up for religious minority because of what they learned. And when I interviewed students, I heard that same story. So that's what Modesto thinks. But Wellesley disagrees. They say sixth grade is best. And I'm showing you this not to, not to boast about my article, but to kind of help give you a little background. In 2010, well, this, this article actually ran in 2011. It's the cover of the Boston Globe magazine. So some of you probably weren't here. Um, and what happened was, Wellesley took its kids on a field trip to the mosque in Roxbury. How many of you are familiar with that controversy? Okay, not everyone. So I'll try, but I'll, I'll try and give the Cliff Notes version. It's a little bit of a soap opera. So they, Wellesley teaches the sixth graders about the world's religions from January to June. They cover Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism. And they want to give these kids kind of hands-on so they take them on field trips, usually to a mosque and to a Jewish temple. I think only once it turns out to the Hindu in Mandir. I thought they were going to try and do that every year, but that has gone by the wayside. And then to represent Christianity, they usually bring in a religion scholar. They're feeling being given Wellesley's a predominantly Christian community. Chances are most of those kids have been in a church. The chances of them having been in, in a Jewish house of worship or a Muslim house of worship are much less. So they thought visually this would be Social studies coordinator specifically wanted to take them to Roxbury because he thought that would show them diversity of Islam. And if you go to the Roxbury Mosque, which I have, and you look at the line of worshipers during the call to prayer, you will see incredible diversity in terms of race and ethnicity. So that was his thought. And so he, and he purposely wanted to take them where there was active worship. Before I complete the story, does anybody, can anybody guess why that might be? a problem on a public school field trip, there being active worship when kids are there? Any, any guesses out there? Okay, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> All right. Um, so what happened was a male worshiper came up to a handful of boys and said, hey, you want to check it out? You want to come stand in the line of prayer with me? Mind you, this is a public school field trip. If it were a private school field trip, you know, I think it, it's not a separation of church and state issue. It's not a constitutional issue. So he did this. Meanwhile, there's this mother sent in with a video camera by a group called Americans for Peace and Tolerance. Anyone heard of that group? So I see just a few nods. And they do not like this mosque. They have been going after this mosque for many years, feeling that it's been funded by possibly terrorist-backed organizations. So that's the backdrop. The mother was involved with that group. She films this whole 
whole thing in the spring of 2010. In September 2010, out comes a video that says, Wellesley, Massachusetts public school students learn to pray to Allah. So now you have a very huge controversy that's just surrounding the school. Media trucks come to Wellesley. And what's interesting, though, is while Wellesley apologized, the school superintendent, she said, yes, we should never have let kids participate. You need to observe, not participate on a field trip. Parents, generally, except for the one who took the video, stood by the kids, I mean, stood by the school system and said, we love this program. It exposes our kids to the world's religions. It's this important. They need to learn about it. So the parents were generally very supportive. This is Jonathan Rabinowitz, one of the teachers. And he, um, along with Adam Blummer, really, really supported the program. I want to read you one little section about why, why Wellesley thinks sixth grade is the absolute perfect time to do this. At the, oh, and one other thing before I start reading this, <coughs> it took me months to get Wellesley to let me spend four to six months in the school. And you can probably imagine, those of you who are working in education can probably imagine why. We've just been huge controversy of course, hey, can I come in and spend six months? But after a while, they said, okay. So at the middle school, Adam Blummer became my ally as he got a sense that I want to show readers what the class was about and address the concerns that had grown out of the controversy, including some people's belief that sixth grade was far too early for an academic class about religion. Blummer sounded like a missionary when he spoke about the course. So fervent was his belief that sixth grade was the ideal time for it and that learning about religion was a life skill. He was driven by a memory of when he was a teen growing up in Framingham, another Boston suburb. Jewish, he was knowledgeable about his faith, but knew next to nothing about other religions. Around age 16, he went to a funeral of a friend who was Catholic. When everyone stood to go to the front of the church and accept communion and eat the wafer and drink the wine, signifying the body and blood of Christ, Lummer was terrified. Should he stay in his seat or should he join the line? He had no idea. I related to his story. My closest friend, whom I met on the first day of kindergarten, is Catholic. I accompanied her to Mass on occasion. The first time, like Blummer, I felt awkward, unsure whether to kneel when others did, and whether to follow my friend and join the line heading to communion. But I was brave enough to ask. She whispered to me that I should stay at my seat. Wellesley's course, Blummer believed, could at least give students enough knowledge to know how to act in different houses of worship. He also was not naive. He knew teaching about religion could lead to controversy, even in a liberal town in a state considered among the most secular in the country. He created a two-page letter for teachers to send home to parents before the religions unit began. In that letter, he addressed two questions. Why teach about religion at all? Why teach about it in middle school? He listed several reasons, including religion's role in culture and its attempt to explain the unexplainable, as well as the school system's goal to teach students respect for human differences. And why middle school? Because that's often when children are wrestling with the kinds of questions religion addresses. Who am I? How am I unique? How am I part of a larger community? How do good people act? What is bad? Why do seemingly unexplainable things happen? He also gave parents a heads up about the plan for field trips, describing the excursions as one of the greatest gifts we can give to students. And, and what I would add to that, he didn't talk about this in that particular part of the book, but he and the teachers, all of them that I would speak to, said they also felt reducing bullying was a big reason to do it in the sixth grade, because where is bullying often the worst? Middle school, right. So they saw this not just as a part of making them religiously literate, but also maybe at least helping with some of the bullying issues. And I'm not reading all the stories of the kids, but there's many kids in this book who are Jewish, uh, Jewish Jehovah's Witness, Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, you name it, who told me their stories about the bullying they experienced as soon as they entered the schoolhouse door. And, and there was a Muslim boy at Wellesley who talked about, he, uh, fourth, he was in fourth grade, and you probably heard me tell, say this story, and a kid came up to him at the locker and said, can I check you for once? And he's in fourth grade. And then Celia, who was a Jew Jewish girl who I talk about in the book, when she was moved to Wellesley, maybe she was third or fourth grade, and a, a kid tried to measure her nose with a ruler in reference to the stereotype about big noses and Jews. And then she talked about things that happened around Christmas time and kids would pick on her. And that happened before the sixth grade class. And I'll tell
tell you there's good news later. <laughs> Things got better after the class. I wanted to show you this just so you could take you sort of inside of one of the little field trips, not field trips, big field trips. They usually take about 200 kids on these field trips to the houses of worship. And generally what happens is they take a little tour around the mosque. This is Wayland. They do not go back to the Roxbury Mosque because of the act of worship issue. Because people are there praying five times a day, there's almost no way to get around it. At Wayland, it's a less active mosque. Fridays tend to be the big worship days. So they go in the middle of the week, in the middle of the afternoon, a lot of the prayer time. And they get a tour, they get a, power, they get a PowerPoint talk with photos. <laughs> it's kind of funny, I'm showing you a PowerPoint of a PowerPoint. Ooh. Um, but if you look at the picture, I don't know if you have a laser thing here, nope. Um, in the back, I don't know if anyone can see what that is in the back. Anybody know? Yes. And what that is, is it's actually one of the tour guide photos when she and her family went to Mecca. And so she talked about the five pillars of Islam and the obligations and that you know, if sometime in your life you do the Hajj and you go to Mecca. And she started it out with just a simple phrase, um, peace be with you in Arabic, and that was on the PowerPoint. But it was basically a simple lecture on the basics of Islam. Now telling everyone we're gonna leave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's Adam Blummer, and he's telling everyone we're gonna leave in about five minutes. So ask your last question. And then next to him, there's a near him. There's a woman named Sefi Jelani, who's a physician, and she's the layman's tour guide at the Wayland Mosque. So it's not an imam actually who gives the talk, but she's been trained on the First Amendment issues, so she knows I'm not here to proselytize. I'm here only to give a basic talk. And then there's three college kids in the mix who are Muslim and went to that mosque, and they come to answer questions. And they will talk about their experiences as Muslims as well. Because I think one of the things is the kids learn what's it like to be a religious minority in America, which is sort of a sub-theme of my book. Um, so they love this. They think this sets the stage for high school, though you heard some of the kids' complaints when I talked about earlier. So there's, it's definitely not perfect. And they also believe that going any younger would require heavy teaching, teacher training. And I'll come to that. So now I'm taking to Wichita, Kansas. And this is a first grader. And if you can see the book she's reading, let's see, uh, I'll try this. Let's see. I'm probably going to get the thing wrong, but oh, there we go. It says Three World Religions. <coughs> and that is actually the official core knowledge reading book. Does anybody here know it? Does anybody here know what core knowledge curriculum is? Yeah? Um, so some people don't realize this because it's actually an option whether the teachers decide to do this. A, big, a part of it is the social studies component includes teaching about the world's religions in first grade, second grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. And in first grade, they teach about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Second grade, Hinduism. And I'm going to get this wrong. Let's see. Oh, no. Fourth grade is the spread of Islam. I believe fifth grade they get into Buddhism. And it's very controversial in some quarters because, my goodness, you're teaching about religion, you were talking about religion with kids who are six or seven years old. That sounds crazy. And what happened, the reason I ended up in Wichita, even though there's a school in Malden that does this, there's a, two reasons. One is I really wanted this book to take you to different regions of the country and not be all in Boston. Because I think it's important to get a flavor of the dynamics and, and Kansas is really considered in the middle of America's Bible Belt, no question. And Wichita in particular <laughs> has quite the reputation. And they have some huge evangelical churches. I remember seeing big poster boards about, you know, the world's going to come to an end. Or it, 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 was, it was clear, it was a very religious community. Wichita is also, interestingly, has very liberal people. It's, a, it's just, it's a city. So I'm not going to, you know, you can't, you can't stereotype Wichita. People will try. Um, so I went there, though, because there was this controversy there. And what had really nothing to do with the fact that they were 
teaching about that young. Parents came in, a mother came in or a child came in, and he saw a bulletin board display. And all it said was the five pillars of Islam. And the mother took a photo and sent it to her state lawmaker. And then he took it and he sent it to about four or five more people. And a controversy broke out. Anyone imagine why a controversy would break out over a bulletin board? It was an empty bulletin board other than a title. So the mother thing, the mother's reasoning was there are actually six pillars of Islam, and the sixth one is jihad, and they all want to kill us. And that was sort of the basis of this controversy. There was a group called Prepare to Take Back America that put a picture of this. I hear, you know, you know what I'm talking about? No. But it hit Fox News. It, you know, it hit like all kinds of media outlets. And it was, they're trying to convert our kids to Islam, which is sort of an, another talk I could have given completely because every controversy over this now has to do with Islam. And what happened next was the teachers actually decided to take the bulletin board down, which then got them lambasted by the First Amendment Center scholar who said, well, you're caving in people who don't understand what you're trying to do. But the teachers felt like we've gotten death threats at the school. And they want to somehow make the controversy go away for a while. And it did. And then later they put up a different bulletin board with art projects. But they kept teaching what they were teaching. So let me switch the next one. So this is actually a photo of a class in Wichita. And I want to take you into, it's Deborah Fagg, and she is a first grade teacher. She has taught, at this point, this is 2013, she had taught at the school for eight years. She has no training whatsoever in religion. She did go to school for education. But she acknowledged to me she really didn't know anything about other religions except for her own. <coughs> she was raised Baptist and then later converted to Catholicism. That I can do this, and she uses the core knowledge curriculum, and she literally was sitting in the classroom, actually, I don't know if you can see in the picture, she's holding a, she's holding a book or a binder there, that is verbatim, the core knowledge curriculum, and she doesn't deviate off of that. And what I'd like to do is take you into her classroom. Deborah Fagg, who told me to call her Debbie, treated each fact, each image about a religion as something exciting, something new, something real children could see. They started the unit on the three world religions with a little review. Previously, they had learned about polytheism. And poly means what? The teacher asked. Many, the children recited. Many gods. Monothe monotheistic means how many gods? One, answered the children, who sat on the classroom rug facing fag, stationed in a chair next to a small bulletin board with a list of vocabulary words for the morning, including Christianity, Judaism, Islam, faithful, shrine, and religion. Now remember, these kids are six and seven years old, so that, those are actually pretty big words. She read from the core knowledge programs book for first grade teachers, but often broke from the script to gauge what knowledge the children already had. So she'd do a little questioning. She asked the children to name religious groups. Muslim, one child offered. Hindu, another said. Sharks, a <laughs> third said. <laughs> I avoided chuckling, and so did Fag, who kept a straight face as she commented, that wouldn't be a religion, that would be an animal, okay? She taught them simple definitions. Islam was the religion of Muslims. A shrine was a sacred place. The children struggled to pronounce some of the words, including Christianity, and practiced how to say them with Fag. Okay, crisscross applesauce, and we're ready for an awesome history lesson today, announced their teacher, who asked them to turn and face the classroom smart board where she then showed a picture-laden PowerPoint presentation about the three world religions. It was a lesson on facts, but also an attempt to explain the inexplicable, what religion was and why it came to be. So if you can see the slide here, it looks like it's the sky with the sun shining down. That's what the kids are looking at as she's saying this. Have you ever wondered how the universe came to be, Fag asked, in a voice tinged with a sense of mystery. Several of the children answered, yeah, or why do stars shine at night? Or what makes a rainbow, she asked. Yes, yes, the children responded. Well, you are not alone, Fag said, eyeing the text through her dark colored glasses. Lots of people have wondered about these same things for thousands of years. So far, so good. I like that Fag adhered to core knowledge's philosophy. Teach about religion as a part of history. Don't make judgments. 
In the search for answers, many people began following religion, she told the children. Religion refers to the belief and worship in a superhuman power, she said. Deborah Fagg was open about her Catholic faith in conversation, but showed no bias toward Christianity as she taught. She showed a slide of three houses of worship depicted in bright colors. They kind of faded here. Can you, can you make them out a little bit? A synagogue, a church, and a mosque. The children learned the names of each institution and the symbols that distinguished them. A cross for Christianity, a star of David for Judaism, a crescent and star for Islam. Then she took them on a photographic tour of places of worship in Jerusalem. The Western Wall, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and the Golden Dome of the Rock. Our family had traveled to Israel during the spring of 2014 when my son was in kindergarten. At my, I think I just spoke to Suzanne about this a few minutes ago. At my urging, we visited all three of those sites. It was only about three months before the conflict between Israel and Hamas escalated into war in Gaza. We were allowed to tour the grounds of the Temple Mount and hired a Muslim guide. By the way, I am not sure, frankly, if he went today, if he would be allowed to do that, which is kind of sad. This no is way. such... Our son, by then six and a bit travel weary, tuned in and, and out of the guide's narration. He was quick, though, to reach out and touch the marble of the Dome of the Rock when the guide said that was okay. He marveled at the shine of the Golden Dome and the colorful geometric design below it. They were images that I hoped would remain with him as he grew, just like the photos Fag had shown her students. Sadly, um, I was telling Suzanne I don't know how much he retained, because then this past summer we went to the Amy Church. Actually, I think we did it in Roxbury, the Charleston Shooting Interface Service. And when we get out, we got out, and we said, that was pretty neat. I'm kind of wondering, though, were all the people in that temple Jewish? I don't think they were. <laughs> so now he's seven, and what he what, what didn't translate to him, even though I think the building did have a cross, I mean, he kind of got that they weren't Jewish, but he didn't quite understand that it wasn't a temple, because it's, we hadn't taken him into a lot of houses of worship. We didn't remember. I think it was barely six when we went to the Israel church. So I don't know what that says, but I just want to point that out. Next one. So there are some challenges that I found in Wichita. I don't know if I would find them so much in the Malden school. And I did talk to teachers at a school in Malden. It's, it's a charter school. And they didn't seem to be hung up on their own religion. But when I talked to the Wichita teachers, there was a lot of internal conflict struggle because they are most of them were very devout Christian and lean towards evangelical and a number of them said you know it's brought up that this way this is the way so we talked about and, and they they actually talked about this with me quite openly and what they said was I'm gonna I want to kind of take you over to that because it's, it's sort of an important issue how do you get teachers to teach about this if it goes against their own personal beliefs and what they talked to me about was when we talked with Deborah, because Deborah Fag doesn't have such an issue with it. I think she would I think the principal led me to her. I asked, I didn't really have a choice on which teacher I was gonna get, and she felt she was one of the teachers that truly embraced the core knowledge philosophy about teaching about all religions rather than promoting one. And I believe that is true. And she was so excited, she she was in Target and they had menorahs on sale. I don't know Maybe it was right after Hanukkah. So she, so she bought this menorah, and she couldn't, like, as soon as she found out it was Jewish, it was, like, the first thing she did in the classroom, and she, like, brought me over, and, and she wanted to show me. She's like, hey, look what I found. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen menorahs like that. <laughs> I think if you could go to Walgreens, you could kind of find one like that, too. But no, I didn't say that. But she, and she found one. She showed it to the kids. She's like, I went to Target, and look what I found. And there's oohs and ahs because most of these children – had never seen a menorah before. I think the majority of the kids in the school were Christian, though there were some Jewish kids, there were some Muslim kids. There, there, were, there was somewhat of a mix, because it's a magnet school, so they actually have to have a little more diversity than a regular school. So she's in a slightly different place than some of her colleagues, but she told me when I talked to her that when she first got to the school, the downplaying of Christmas and Easter really bothered her. In her past school in El Dorado, Kansas, they made Easter baskets for the kids for Easter, and at Christmas time they made decorations and they put them on the trees. I believe they still do that. That was only like eight years ago. And so 
So then she gets to Minaha, and the principal is saying, well, we teach core knowledge, and we're going to try, and it's, uh, this is going to sound weird, we're going to try and preach what we teach. You know, we're, we're teaching about all religions, not just one. And so the principal was like, well, I don't know if we should sing Silent Night in the Christmas concert anymore, which I'm thinking if you're going to do a sacred music concert, you probably could, but that's for another topic. Um, but she tried, the principal was really trying to get the teachers to stop doing things like decorating the rooms for Christmas. And that was what a lot of them were used to. And she, she said she actually grew to like this approach and respected the idea, you know, it's better to teach about the diversity of religions than to promote one. Her colleagues, however, different story. Um, one of them who had come to teach to Minaha about 20 years ago resented what she thought was happening. And she said, you know, teachers can't talk about Jesus' birthday at Christmas or sing the songs they used to. And the, the country, she said, was trying so hard to honor other cultures in the world forgotten about the customs in America. In her view, celebrating Christmas in school was one of them. A man echoed a teacher sitting across from her. So she that's how she felt. But the same teacher who was pining for Christmas celebrations told me that the teachers never preached religion in the classroom and that they taught about different religions to help the children understand the world they live in. So she said that you know we're, we're, we understand what we're supposed to do. And they also had quandaries about, well, do we say we're Christian or not? And there was no consistency. Bag said, I'm Christian, I'm going to tell the kids. And I just think it's part of who I am, and that's okay. Another teacher felt like, you know, I think if I say I'm Christian, then I'm showing favoritism, and I'm not going to say. And what I found didn't matter elementary, middle, or high school. There were different issues. There wasn't a consistent policy about how does a teacher handle their own religion in the classroom? And Wellesley, Dr. Bittes said, well, you know, I'm clearly Jewish. <laughs> so, and I can talk about my experiences going to Jewish day school and how it put me in a Jewish bubble. So he feels like it adds to his teaching. Another teacher didn't reveal it and let the kids guess at the end of the year. And he was actually an evangelical Christian and the kids would guess that he was Buddhist. So it's like he's very proud of the fact that he could essentially be very neutral. So I, I think it's an interesting question. I don't know what the right answer is. I think that it's don't promote. That's really the answer, right? So let me see about hold on a second. Next one. I'm just showing you this picture because there's always a lot of talk about, well, we don't teach, you know, Christianity has been wiped out of America's public schools. This is a case where they're actually teaching about Jesus as a part of the curriculum. And this is a representation of Jesus that the core knowledge So I wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges and also parental fears. I guess I'm showing you words when I'm talking to you about something else, probably a PowerPoint no-no, so forgive me. Um, but in terms of the challenges, you heard some of them, right? They, how do I handle my own religion? How do I handle the desire to celebrate Christmas? And yet I'm supposed to teach about these other religions, so that's an issue. Um, the other thing was, how do you handle conversation in the classroom? And I, when I was watching Deborah Fagg's classroom one day, and she was teaching about Judaism, a kid blurted out, all Jews are bankers. <laughs> yeah, she, they remind me, these are six-year-old kids, right? And it's obviously something she's heard, and she's repeating it in the classroom. So if you were the teacher in the classroom, what would you do? Anyone want to guess what, what would you do? Anyone want to tell me if that happened? Am I putting anyone on the spot? No one wants to say? Okay. You'd say, no, that's not true. I mean, right. you always have to represent the truth. So this is a caricature. Right. So you push back, you have to push back against it, which raises the question of objectivity. But we'll get back to that. Right. So what she did is she let it go. Oh, go ahead. Did you want to? Oh, no? no. Okay. So she let it go. And I was a little bit like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she didn't say anything. And I interviewed another teacher, a second grade teacher in the same school, who had taught there for 15 years. And she said, well, that's a teachable moment. You can't let that go. I, I did ask Deborah Fab, well, why did you say anything? And she said, well, because it would go against the values those parents are teaching their children. <laughs> she knew I was Jewish, but I was like, okay. <laughs> All right, let me, let me absorb this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. And so then I, I talked to 
the subject teacher, and thank God she brought me back down to earth. Um, I didn't correct, I didn't say anything in the classroom when it happened. I'm an observer, so so this other teacher, second grade teacher, Angelique Bad Badgett, he's in the book, said not only would I speak up, but I would use it as a wonderful teachable moment. And I would teach them about stereotypes. And I would say, well, you know, of course all Jews are not bankers, you know. In society, there are Jews who are lawyers, who are janitors, you know, what I, you know, and I would talk about that, but then talk about what is a stereotype, and use it to teach that lesson about that. And so that kind of raised questions in my mind. Is, does core knowledge include training about handling conversations? You know, any, because I think it's not just about religion. If you were teaching about race, too, how would you handle it? If someone said a bigoted comment in the context of the conversation. And that was something I tackled in the book through my interview with Angelique. And I think she gave the right answer. And that was, you got to use these as teachable moments. But then the question I would raise is, what role should education schools play in this? What role should the organization providing the curriculum play in this? You know, whose job is it to make sure that teachers handle the conversations in an appropriate way? I mean, I guess you could say, well, they all must have common sense, and common sense would say you don't let it go. But she's using a script, so you know, it was. I think it, it was upsetting to watch. I was happy to hear that not all teachers felt that way, and I think it's a problem with the curriculum that they're just handing it to them. And that the training is really how to use the curriculum, but sort of in a very mechanical way. It doesn't, because religion and race, sex ed, all these issues, you can't just say, here, here you go. Um, so the parental fear. I wanted to raise this, this all came up in my inter interviews with parents. So one parent, he was an atheist, and his wife was a Buddhist. Their child was now, I think the child was in first grade when I interviewed him. And they hadn't yet talked about religion in the home, and her kid, kid starts bringing home worksheets about the different religions. And he found that upsetting at first, and he complained to the school. He actually calmed down once he understood the purpose of the curriculum and decided it was okay. Another parent, um, this was the messianic Jewish couple in the book who protested about the bulletin board. They also protested about Hindu, learning about Hinduism second grade and said, well, we're teaching our child that there is one God and only one God. And this goes against, this is going to confuse him. And so the school's response was, he can sit out when we do that lesson. And then I already covered, you know, what I, how can teachers manage young kids' comments? That's a parental concern because some of them felt like from things they had heard, the teachers weren't equipped to do this. I think we've covered this. And elementary teachers don't know much about religions other than their own. We might say that about middle and high school teachers too, depending on what they got. And then the question that I, you know, that a kid rose to me, will my child want to adopt a different religion or any religion? And there hasn't been, sadly, there hasn't been a whole bunch of studies about this topic. So I can't say that it's never happened. But anecdotally, and also based on the Modesto researchers' work, there's been no proof that teaching about religion in the public school leads a child to change his religion. I also think it's a hard thing to sort out. You know, how do you know if a child changed his mind, what caused that change? Was it learning about other religions? Was it meeting, you know, you, I think it would be hard to sort it out. How am I doing on time? I'm almost done, but I just wanted to. Are, are we good? Okay. I wanted to show you this because, again, this isn't what a normal elementary school classroom looks like. And the picture up top is. I don't have to tell you. <laughs> Everyone knows what that is, right? <coughs> and that is in nearly every core knowledge school in the country. There's probably about 1,300 of them. And so they have the picture of the Last Supper, but they also have famous pictures of other religions. And I think they have a famous picture of a mosque, and they have something that represents something Jewish, and all of the religions that they teach. So when people complain that they had you have a display about Islam and you kick Christianity out of the schools, the principal would take people on the tour of the school and she'd show them the Last Supper painting just to say, prove a point. And then you see there the Islamic art bulletin board. That replaced the one that was controversial. And no one complained about that. And then over there, that's from Mrs. Bad's classroom with the menorah. And she had created a little Jewish display. She had something about, I think this 
something there about Passover, there's the dreidel, the goldfish is the class goldfish. <laughs> I don't know if that's a goldfish. It's a fish. Okay. And then finally, can starting younger make a difference? So I want to hear your guys' thoughts, but my conclusion is even with all of the issues raised, I think it can make a difference. I didn't say a lot about my own story. It is in the book, but what I'll say is when I was in fourth grade, my family moved from Western New York to Ohio, and I became the only Jew in my school, and they knew nothing about Jews. And when they know nothing, they tease. And they find things just, you know, you're going to hell because you don't believe in Jesus. And I'm pretty sure very few of my classmates knew that Jesus was Jewish or that our religions actually had a strong connection. I don't think they knew that. I don't think I knew much about that either until I was older. But... What I wondered was, would things have been different if we had learned about many religions instead of one? And maybe because I'm idealist, I believe they would have been better. I told you earlier about, I think, Celia, the Jewish kid in Wellesley, and Zen, and the bullying they experienced. Fast forward, and Celia talks about being in eighth grade, having 80 kids from the middle school come to her bat mitzvah, and being super excited because they got to learn about what they read about in the classroom, they got to learn about it for real. She said that was very different for her, and now she felt more proud to be a Jew, and she thinks that's partly because of the course. She's now a junior, senior in high school, she still feels that way. So it hasn't changed for her. Zen, who's the Muslim boy that they tried to check for bombs at the locker, said that in eighth grade, when they had a substitute teacher come in, substitute teacher came in and started saying, you know, Boston Marathon bombing had just happened. And so she was talking about the Muslim coming into our country, changing things, and wanting to hurt us. And she was implying as if this were all Muslim. So Zen is sitting there in his chair feeling more and more awful. And then the next day, when the regular teacher came back, several of the kids spoke up before Zen even had a chance. And they said, you know, this isn't what we learned. They said, you know, we learned that you can't stereotype everyone. And she was promoting a stereotype. And we thought that was wrong. And so now they're in eighth grade and they kind of got it. And, and I talked to Zen. Zen came to my reading in Wellesley. Now he's, now he's a junior in high school, much taller than I am. Back then he was about here. And he, by the way, his whole family came to my reading with an aunt and an uncle, and they bought like five books for everyone because they're so proud of Zen for what he said when he was 11 and 12 and 14. Um, but what he said was, I said, well, how are things now? She had this course in sixth grade, and he said things are pretty good in eighth grade. And he said he thinks it's still maintaining a difference. But on the bus the other day, someone said something obnoxious. But he said, you know, I still think that it made a difference because we learned a little bit more about each other. I wanted to end with something about the people in this picture, and I talked to Eric ahead of time whether I should ask. So by a show of hands, how many people know which religion is represented in this photo?
and mother had come to the United States in 1990. Bupendra could say only his name, his birthday, and a few other words in English when he started school. Worse, the boy who would grow to be six feet four inches as an adult was the tallest child in his kindergarten class. As I met with Bupinder and his parents one evening in their living room, his mother remembered how she cried over her son's pain and his decision not to wear the patka. She didn't want her son teased, but she also wanted to stick to his faith tradition. That his son no longer felt comfortable wearing the patka hurt Bupinder's father, but he understood. When Bupinder's father came to the United States, he cut his hair that same year and stopped wearing a turban except at Temple. There were fewer Sikhs in Modesto back then, and he thought he might not get a job if he looked too different. Bupinder took the World Religions course in 2005 at a Modesto high school. Did the course make a difference, I asked? He said yes and no. Yes, because he learned about other religions, but no, because he could hear snickering when the students watched a video about India and its religion. Friends sometimes were curious and asked him questions about Sikhism, but all Bupinder wanted to do was avoid the situation. He didn't want to stand out as different, and the course highlighted religious differences. His father, though, remembered something positive from the course. One day, his son came home from school and announced, hey, Dad, at least now these kids know who I am. Now 22, Bupinder majored in biochem at the University of the Pacific. After college graduation, he began work as an operations manager at Frida Lay. I, I couldn't figure out why he didn't pursue biochem, but that's another story. <laughs> he thinks the high school course made the biggest difference for him in college. He felt more at ease talking about religion, whether his own or someone else's. So he felt more at ease in college talking about religion, and he credited his high school with giving him that confidence. It surprised him to see that many of his college peers had almost no background on the world's religions. Many didn't even know Sikhism was a religion. The biggest problems for his family have been in the community at large. Even now, when Bupinder's family stops at a red light on the way to a Sikh event or service, strangers sometimes flip a middle finger at his father, who wears his turban to religious events. Bupinder keeps his dark hair short and still will not wear a turban. And they do in Modesto before they teach the course. And I don't know how many of them got it in education school. So I'm not actually a religious student. I'm not an education student. Um, but in high school myself, I took a lot of um, constitutional law classes. And for me, when I learned about the First Amendment and about what schools are allowed to teach and what kind of things are um, under the law and what are not, it kind of helped me understand when the school is getting out of line and what kind of things are right and what are wrong and where I can speak out. So I feel like 
at least somewhere in the school education system, they should let the students be empowered enough to know where the school is set up getting out of line. And I think that's really important. Yeah, I, I of course agree. Yeah. And also that students should know their rights as well, religiously. There's kind of two sides, freedom of religion, right? And then separate from church and state. Question? So in terms of students, students yeah. rights, and I know that there have been collaborations with the law school and there are actually clinics and, and, and courses where they teach students and high schools about their rights, but it's not a nor a fixed part of the curriculum. Yeah. And probably not also part of the curriculum that's one of those mandated aspects now that's <coughs> part of you know testing. So I think it's interesting when I think about teacher preparation is learning the legal part, but when we talk about teachers' comfort in talking about these issues themselves, oh, yeah. there's a lot of personal, you know, development yes. and, and, and knowing yourself that comes into your ability to, to manage more complicated discussions in the classroom. Yeah, but no one will graduate from this institution without two courses in theology. So that's good. Some and some of those yeah. involve Christianity and another religion. That's one of the tracks. Bible's another one. So, right. you know, I mean, so I have whether you're education or another major. It doesn't matter. That's Every great. student in this university. I wish I had it. So I, I mean, I have Lynch School students with sure. School of Management and Arts and Sciences students in my course, and so in terms of conversation at a, a more academic level about religion. They're, they should be more comfortable when they graduate. In a start, of course, one of the values of students in a liberal arts university who are in school of education, who are also doing a full core and, and a whole arts and science right. major in addition. They are not narrowly trained, but I think there is something kind of in the person of how they figure out how to bring that together I teach separation of church and state at the college level, and uh, historians have really almost completely changed uh, how they understand how church and state came about in America. I think an older generation was taught that the founders included Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who were deists at best, and perhaps even atheists, and they wanted to separate church and state to protect the government against the sectarianism of the churches. But I think it's now almost universally understood that it was religious people, and especially Baptists, who wanted separation of church and state to protect religion against government interference. And Baptist tradition is thoroughly seeped in separation of church and state. And I find that uh, today's students having recently gone to high school don't know that. Uh, so I don't know that that's knowledge that's kind of, I often wonder when sort of scholars really sort of settle something. How long does it take to get back into the high schools who are probably still saying, you know, Thomas Jefferson went to France, was an enlightenment figure? Well, and what I, what I like about the Wellesley course is the teacher incorporates instruction about the First Amendment, and yeah. they do learn about some of that, but not all of these courses do. So the question is, do they teach about it in government, or do they just memorize, you know, what the, what the amendment is? I didn't get much of it in high school. <laughs> I actually have a Oh, um, is there any model that does the first, second, fourth, fifth, and then ninth grade? Because I think that would be really interesting. So in Wichita, that is the only school in, in that entire big city, it's a big city system, that is a core knowledge school. So then in middle school, the kids do get instruction about world religions, and then in high school, they get fairly typical um, world history. Modesto has the ninth grade world religions course, but what's pretty typical is that you'll get something in middle school and then you get something again in high school. I don't know if they call it a model, it's just kind of the typical, based on state standards, here's what we're gonna do. And then in ninth grade, they might get world geography. In Modesto, they do geography and the religion thing in the same year. Yeah. Uh, this is a question, or something I wonder about. How do we know that teaching about uh, religions promotes toleration, promotes respect? Yes. Um, 
And, and I suppose my own wonderment, um, and I, my own background is at the interface of theology and education uh, for the sake of uh, honesty and advertising or whatever. Um, but we've always thought about teaching religion as having, having two possibilities. One, you teach it in, a, in an objective way, uh, teach people about it. Yep. And the other is that you teach it to try to get people to become it, to take it on as their identity. Uh, and I think there's a middle ground that instead of simply teaching about it, you teach about it, of course, but you teach it in a way that they can learn from it. Yes. And not just, they learn from it for their own lives. So you're doing the Muslim tradition of zakat, for example. Well, there's a, a great deal that anybody of goodwill can learn from that practice of generosity toward the poor, of caring for the downtrodden, and so on, and could be inspired by that. So that they learn from it, even though we don't, we're not trying to make Muslims out of them, they remain devout Jews and Christians, Buddhists, or whatever. But they can learn from that, or from the, the, the Muslim tradition of positive. So I'd love to tackle that first question. You said, how do, how do we know if they become more respectful? And I mean, there's no, like, been no quantitative study, so it's, anic there, it's anecdotal. Though Emil Lester, in his research, he asked students questions to try and figure it out, and what he was finding was that most students would say, yes, you know, now when I see someone walking down the street, wearing religious garb, I don't think they're straight, you know, but it's still, it's not a, there's not a, it's not really, I would call that a scientific study, I would call it, it's more anecdotal, but to me the bigger, to me it, it's more of, if you teach them about religion, this can be a really nice effect of it, but the yes, most important thing is reducing, uh, even no. maybe just as important. And I'm, I'm totally in favor of doing it, religious so, but I'm saying can we even do better? Oh yes. Simply learning about it. And yes. the, as the example, there's the experiences going on yeah. in, in some Catholic schools yeah. where a, a growing and increasing percentage of the student population are not Catholic. Yes. Uh, I know a, a Catholic high school in Chicago where 89% of the students are from all the traditions. Wow. Uh, only 11% are Catholic, and of that 11%, probably half of them are simply cultural Catholics, wouldn't be practicing Catholics. So you have about 5% practicing Catholics. So, and yet they want to maintain a Catholic curriculum and without proselytizing, they're very committed to but not But they won't no teach way. about the other religions. Uh, they'll teach about the other religions, but even when they teach about Catholicism, they're trying to teach it in a way that they, anybody could learn from it, rather than simply trying to get them to become it. So, so but then a bit can we do better? Yes. <laughs> That's the whole point of it, yes. I, I, think, I think, I don't want to be too simplistic in my answer here. Yes, I think that schools can definitely do better. They can do more of what they're doing. Will we get there? I think it's going to be a long time before we get there. Because like Wellesley sort of, Wellesley and Modesto are sort of like the two sort of higher standards of what I've been seeing out there. A lot of teachers at most are spending two to three days covering religion. How much can you cover other than saying, well, Muhammad was X and this was X and this was X, which isn't really getting in anything in depth. What I do know is the elective courses sometimes go in a lot more depth than what they're teaching in a required class. And I, what I would love to see is if we could do more of it in the required classes, go deeper. I think Wellesley's getting there. They do have some really interesting discussions. They actually draw Venn diagrams and they look at, you know, where are the religions alike, where are they different? They do talk about the charity aspect of Islam. I mean, does that, I, I don't know if that makes students then want to go give charity. But I think they're getting the message about what do, you know, what, what are aspects of religion rather than just here are the facts, ma'am. You know, I think it's, it's a bit of a mix. But I'm not seeing highly sophisticated courses on the world's religions of public schools at this point. And I, and I think it might be a while before we get there because there's still, I think what the dean was referring to, I mean, there's still, a lot of teachers aren't comfortable even mm -hmm. talking about it. I mean, in the elementary level, we're gonna be lucky if a lot of schools will even try what Wichita is doing because they're gonna be worried about having happened, you know, w what you have happened teachers who don't know how to manage the conversations. So I think I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I would love to see people go even more in depth than they are. It's, it's you know, right now, it's like Modesto doesn't go in depth at all. It's very shallow. Uh, hi, uh, I just have a quick question. Um, in your experience, uh, what, um, how were the parents involved seems like uh, after your uh, talk, it was mostly the parents reacting 
to this, and they weren't, they didn't seem like they were the school engaged. ever. Well, not only engaged, the school didn't even bother. Yeah, so do. it was, you know, and it varies by school, yeah. but what I found in Wichita was, so Core Knowledge actually has created a very nice letter that teachers could send to parents that fully explains what you can, what they're doing and why they're doing it, and the conversations that teachers should have in the classroom versus where, where they should tell a child we should do this at home. Wichita, the school, was not using it. After the controversy, they started making more of an attempt to talk to parents about what we're doing. I think they just assumed, well, if you know we're a core knowledge school, this is part of the curriculum. I wouldn't know that. <laughs> you know, you're expecting parents to leap through a curriculum that involves reading, writing, social studies, math, everything, and find the piece about religion. So I think that's a, an area where the schools need to improve. Wellesley, though, not only do they send the letter, but a lot of the projects involve the kids engaging with their families on the topic. And the teacher will often say, now go home and talk to your parents about what we saw today. So, that, so they, they want the parents to be clued in, but they also have the kids give presentations to their parents and neighbors about a particular religion as part of the project. So I think like Wellesley has its tremendous buy-in as the parents are, they know about it, they're included in it. In Modesto, they're high school students, and they learn about it at open house you know, for the high schools. And that's when they learn about it, and the teachers were talking to me about some of the conversations that come up. But beyond that, once the class happens, that connection is pretty much over. And there are 40 kids per class in the Modesto high schools, California, that big class sizes. So Wellesley had like 20, 22 kids in that class, very different. But yeah, I think that's a missing piece because I think you might avoid a lot of the controversies if you got the parents in the loop sooner. Oh yeah, and I, and I actually would not bad about that very topic. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is a uh, necessary question, but um, do they also talk about atheists? Like, um, not having a religion. Yes. Uh, wait, I lost my train of thought. Um, I know the question. Yeah. 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 You're, you're asking, do they talk about people who are not affiliated with yeah, religion? Like it's, atheist, it's like, agnostic, secular humanist. They don't necessarily, it's because I feel like this class would teach um, about a certain, about the different sets of beliefs people have. Like atheism, I don't know. So but, um, what I found is like it depends on the class. Modesto does, as part of the beginning lectures. It, it's, it's put right in there, it's actually in the textbook. They kind of follow the textbook to the letter. A little bit, it's a little bit better than that, but they, they're very uniform how they do it. And it includes, like, what it, it includes definition of atheism and agnosticism. And I think they also talk about secular humanist. There's a passage in the book where the teacher is showing a video about a church and state case fought in Rhode Island. And it was filed by a young woman who considers herself atheist. And she opposed a, I can believe it was, it had been up there for 40 years, it was like a plaque or a banner. Jessica Alquist was the name of the student. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and it, it was a Christian prayer, I believe. And she was atheist and she opposed it. And so she talked about, the teacher talked about that case in the school, also as a way of introducing someone who was atheist and how when schools promoting religion, how that affects them. So that certainly was happening in Modesto. Wellesley, to a smaller extent, first grade class, no. <laughs> so, and it varies. I mean, I think in the world history classes, no. Because they're just like, boom, 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 you know, going through. Uh, do you, this is a two-part question that hopefully can be very concise. Number one, do you think religion is a different kind of subject than everything else that's, that's being taught there? And if it is a different kind of subject, something that's hot uh, and and um, and crucial to someone's life, is getting it a little bit wrong a lot worse than getting it a little bit right? Excellent question there. Um, a lot of people, when I, you know, they say, oh, this sounds a lot like sex ed, you know, because it's kind of like a taboo subject, right? I do think it's much hotter than a lot of things. That, I'd say religion, right? Well, you know, we. Race, yes and no, not, it, it's, it's a different, it's, I put that in a different category because it's not as controversial maybe, maybe to teach about race as it would be to teach about religion. 
how you teach it, maybe. But, um, but religion, yeah, I, I think that yes, it's a very hot topic. And and the other part of your question was, sorry. Well, is it different in such a way? It's not just controversial, but, but if you get it wrong, in some different way. You know, I I, I think getting it wrong is a big. It's a pretty big deal, and. And it was funny, like this New York Times review took issue with me for raising uh, the mispronunciation thing. I don't think is such a big deal, but I think getting the facts wrong, getting misrepresenting what a religion is, I think it's a pretty big deal to get it wrong. And that's why I think the training of teachers is pretty important. Um, and hopefully, the core knowledge curriculum is just perfect, since some of those teachers just use it. You know, it's like <coughs> they just read it. Um, I do remember this thing about the woman saying cedar instead of seder. And I picked on it only because to note the lack of training. Because here she is teaching the kids how to pronounce Christianity and all these other words, but she doesn't know how to pronounce most of the Jewish words in the curriculum. And probably doesn't know how to pronounce most of the Muslim references as well. And if you're going to be teaching the kids how to pronounce Christianity and these other words, then maybe you should learn how to pr pronounce what you're teaching. The, the superintendent said, "Is well, you know, it's okay if the kids correct her, and I agree with that, but are they going to correct her? Yeah, I don't know if I would have corrected my teacher if she were teaching about Judaism when I was a kid, because I was the only one, you know, so yeah, I didn't want to be all that noticed. So I, I, think it, I think it is a huge issue about getting it right. I mean, I think it would be bad to get anything right. But you're also talking, I mean, anything wrong, but you're also talking about something that's so intensely personal for everyone in that room. So I think, yes, I agree with you. <laughs> All right, I'm not sure if, you, if that's what you think, but I, I do think it's important to get it right. Linda, which stars, I'm sure you know, is the home of the Koch, the Koch brothers. And there was an yes. article last year about, in the New York Times, about how they're spending so much money in Wichita itself, which its residents now call Cokeville. Mm -hmm. So did you see any of that? You show? know, interestingly, I didn't. I, I I knew about it, but I didn't see, oh, I didn't see evidence of it in the school, in the er areas where I was training. I mean, I saw more, it was also the place called the Summer of Mercy, where they had had um, the abortion protests that went on there, and it was a pretty violent summer, yeah. and George Tiller was killed, okay. the abortion doctor. And people were, it was interesting, people were talking more about that to me, even though it happened so long ago. They, oh, well, that's where, that's the church, you know? And, and see that billboard? That's his pastor, Terry Fox, and he's a big pastor here. And so they were more intent in pointing out that kind of stuff to me than talking about the Koch brothers. So I'm sure that, you know, they, they have a huge influence on the city, and I know that. I don't know so much on the public schools, so. Yep, okay, one more question. Figure out how to lower this, so. I'm curious about uh, criteria of inclusion. And so by what criteria would you decide not only what religions to include in the curriculum, but then within a religion, there's such diversity. How do you get at that uh, in any way? So what criteria would you apply? Well, so or have you I seen can tell apply? you what criteria I would apply. I can tell you what criteria I'm seeing that schools are applying. Um, and it seems to be fairly consistent. They're sort of looking at they tend to always do Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and say they do it because of the role they play in world history, and then they'll add Buddhism and Hinduism. And then beyond that, they'll look at who's in their community. And then I raise the question, well, what if the, the community is pretty much 100% Christian? What do you do then? And then they're like, well, we're, we look at the main three. And most of the state standards, when they mention the religions, tend to mention those three monotheistic <coughs> religions that I just mentioned. California. There's been a push, and I think it's finally gotten in there to make Sikhism a part of it, just because that's who's there. Um, so the criteria seems to be, well, let's look at what's sort of common in world history to talk about. And then let's look at who's in our community, which is sort of a loose criteria, because you don't necessarily know everyone who's in your community. Not everybody identifies. I think it's a good question. I mean, if I, if I was to weigh in on this topic, what I would say is you can't possibly cover all religions and Modesto is trying to cover nine religions in nine weeks. And I don't know if that's exactly, they're gonna kick, you know, some, some of the teachers get upset with this. I'm not sure if that's the right approach because should you go the mile wide, is it the mile wide inch deep? Am I getting that expression right? I always get cliches wrong. 
or is it better to go in depth or more in depth like Wellesley tries to do in three or four religions and hope that kids kind of can get some conceptual things out of that that they can apply as they try to learn about other religions. Sort of the, it's the critical thinking versus the facts argument. So that's kind of where I'm at on it. I agree. Well, thank you. We have a few minutes afterwards to agree. Thank you very much.